I've always wanted the string quartet to be vital and energetic and alive and cool and not afraid to kick ass and be absolutely beautiful and ugly if it has to be. But it has to be expressive of life to tell the story with grace and humor and depth, and to tell the whole story if possible. Those are the words of artistic director and founder of the Kronos Quartet, violinist David Harrington. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Jerome L. Green Performance Space. I'm Helga Davis from Q2 Music. And tonight's concert by the Kronos Quartet is the culmination celebration of this groundbreaking quartet. For 40 years, the Kronos Quartet has been reimagining the string quartet experience. They've performed thousands of concerts worldwide, and their list of collaborators is a who's who of 20th and 21st century music. Kronos has made more than 50 recordings and commissioned more than 800 works, and they're about to add to that number. Next month, Nonesuch, the group's longtime label, will release a 40th anniversary five CD box set and a new album called A Thousand Thoughts. Please, please help me in welcoming the Kronos Quartet to the green space. David Harrington and John Sherba violins, Hank Dutt viola, and their newest member, Sonny Yang cello. So they're going to get set up, and while they're getting set up, I'll tell you about the first piece they're going to play this evening. It's called Death to Cosmetia by the Montreal-based composer Nicole Lisey. Her, her works range from large ensemble to solo turntable. Some instruments you might find in her pieces include an Atari video game console and karaoke tapes. This piece, Death to Cosmetia, is a reference to the electronic synthesizer music which started in Germany in the early 1970s. If you're in the green space tonight or watching online, feel free to tweet your comments or questions for Kronos to hashtag Kronos at 40. So that's hashtag, you've got to spell the whole thing out, K-R-O-N-O-S-A-T and the numbers four zero. Here now, the Kronos Quartet on Q2 Music.
That's quite a way to start off the evening. The Kronos Quartet performing Nicole Lise's Death, I don't want to mess it up now, right? Death to Cosmisha. Live in the Jerome L. Green performance space, we're celebrating 40 years of the Kronos Quartet here tonight on Q2 Music. So let's meet two of the members of the quartet now. Our founder and longest serving member, Mr. David Harrington, and Kronos's newbie, Sonny Yang. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to ask you practical questions, but what, what is, what's the little space probe thing? That there? is known as a thingamagoop number two. <laughs> and I don't know what a thingamagoop number three is, but I hope to find out someday. What about the thingamagoop number one? I, I don't know what that is either. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And what's our turntable thingy? Exactly it. It's a turntable. That, uh, you mean the instruments? That's, oh, that's John's. What is that called? Is that just? Yeah, it's a, it's a portable turntable. There we go. It's a portable turntable. Simple. <laughs> David, happy anniversary. First Thank things you. first. And just take us back a little bit and tell us what the quartet's mission was when you started 40 years ago. And let us know, too, whether or not that mission has changed or evolved. Well, I think uh, the first rehearsal that Kronos had was in very early September 1973, and we played, tried to play Webern's Six Bagatelles. And the second piece we tried to play was Bartok's Third Quartet. And the only thing that I hoped after the first rehearsal is that there would be a second rehearsal. <laughs> and after the second rehearsal, I was really hoping we might last the rest of the week. And, you know, if you do something long enough, uh, the weeks start adding up. They turn into months, and pretty soon there's a year, and um, that's what happened. Tell us about this piece that we heard, Death of Cosmisha. Uh, it's by Nicole Lise, and tell us a little bit about why you chose it. Well, um, first of all, meeting Nicole Lise is a real um, special experience. She's um, uh, a remarkable person in that um, most often when you meet somebody that as a kid took machines apart and took electronic things apart and then put them back together, usually it's guys. The last person I met like that was uh, Trimpen. Uh, some of you may know about Trimpen. He's, he's the wild man musical instrument inventor from Germany that lives in Seattle. And uh, apparently he took everything apart. Well then, you know, 35 years later, I meet Nicole Lise and I hear that she did the same thing. And, and I think, wow, that's great. And um, she had a love for vintage electronic instruments. And plus, the music I heard of hers was fabulous, and she had this gleam in her eye when she talked about things. And I thought, she's got to write something for us. She has to. And we had a concert scheduled, and turned out that she wrote Death to Cosmisha for us, and we had a lot of fun playing it. And we've been playing it for the last several years now. Sonny, you're the newest member of the quartet. You've been with the quartet last, for a year now, a little um, more? My first tour with the quartet was end of June in New Haven last year. Ah, okay. Tell us about the process of getting to know and work with your fellow quartet members here. Well, um, after I heard that I'll be joining the quartet, I packed my stuff from LA, drove to San Francisco, and I had, I was given two really tall piles of music to learn mm. for my first few tours. And so. Sorry. <laughs> and they were, every single one of them were specifically written for Kronos. So, first few months um, leading to my very first tour, I mainly spent my day. Um, going back and forth between my room and the rehearsal space, <laughs> just learning new things. So it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. But um, now and it's 
you know, the, it's easing down a bit. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to ask this. So you get in, you're new, you jump into this seat, right. you're practicing all the time, and you're with people who have been together for a really you long know. time. Were they nice to you? <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't ask me that. Okay, sorry. No, no, That's were. why I whispered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they were really nice. Okay. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Here, I'm going to help you. Let's move on and tell us about that instrument that you were playing. Um, well, this one is called Stylophone. Mm -hmm. um, this is the one that sounds. I don't know if you can. Is it like and this one is called Omnichord. Um, actually, both instruments I had to learn for my audition, and oh. I remember, <laughs> I remember. Well, they gave me 38 pieces to learn for the audition, just written for Kronos. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> one of the <laughs> one of the pieces. It said Lise, and it, on the below the title of the piece is that you have to play omnichord and stylophone. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> so, I went, <laughs> so I went online and Googled, and then there were some YouTube m tutorials on how to play it. So I <laughs> spent hours just you know, watching that and trying to figure out how to play it without actually having the instrument in front of me. <laughs> it was interesting, but yeah. <laughs> What was your first reaction when you found out that you were in the quartet? I think I was driving in LA to my teacher's house. And, because uh, that's all you do in LA anyway. That's all drive. you do. I mean, it's, it feels like uh, you're just stuck in traffic all the time. But I pulled over and David called me. And um, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure after I hung up, I just started screaming yeah. <laughs> by myself in my car. I'm glad a cop didn't call me or something. But you know. <laughs> Do you remember when you first heard the quartet? Yes, I, I remembered it very clearly. And that was um, when I was a high school student at Interlaken Arts Academy. That was, I think it was my very first year studying in America. And they came to my high school. And um, yeah, it's. It was kind. It, w it was one of those moments where you, th you thought you knew every you know like a lot about your instrument and string instruments, and then after the concert, that the whole th my my concept of string instruments just changed, and I remember thinking, "Gosh, anything is possible. I don't just have to play Bach and Beethoven. I can play rock music, jazz, whatever." So I I remember leaving the concert hall feeling really inspired and just excited about what I can do. Mm. So, yeah. This is really nice. And I remember, I, and, and then I bought my very first Chrono CD, which was Black Angels. Mm. So, yeah. David, tell us about the next piece we're going to hear, Last Kind Words. It's by a blues mu musician whose name is Gishi Wiley. And the arrangement for this is by Jacob Garchik. Yes. Well, um, well before you uh, tell uh, us, I have uh, to say I love, I love the lyrics. The last kind words I heard my daddy say, if I die in the German war, please don't bury my soul. Ah, child, just leave me out. Let the buzzards eat me whole. Well, I heard this music for the first time about three years ago. Um, on a CD, and then I uh, found it on YouTube as well, and um, I couldn't believe that I had never heard this before. Mm. I mean, it, to me, it was, it's like one of the great American pieces. That's all there is to it, and it and, um, turns out there's only about five recordings of her that are, exist, and the other night someone told me uh, the reason it was recorded in a certain town in Wisconsin is that that's where they made um, 
uh, record players, cabinet record players, and and so they would bring musicians there and and make uh, 78 records to sell the cabinet record players in, in the early 1930s. And um, anyway, uh, I generally respond to music that magnetizes me. This piece totally magnetized me, and we didn't have any choice. We had to play it. And how about the arrangement by J Jacob Garchik? Jacob Garchik, uh, Jacob went to high school with my children, and so I've known him for a long time, and he uh, has made some beautiful arrangements for us, including um, uh, mm -hmm. recently uh, um, a concert's worth of music with the Malian musicians, Trio de Cali, and earlier he did the, the work uh, that we played with um, uh, uh, Alim Kasimov and his daughter Fargana, and he's one of our favorite people and favorite arrangers, and I can't wait to play it for you. Here we go. Last Kind Words by Gishi Wiley, arranged by Jacob Garchik, the Kronos Quartet, live in the green space.
Last Kind Words, a blues-inspired work by Gishi Wally, arranged for the Kronos Quartet by Jacob Garchik. The Kronos Quartet is playing live in the green space tonight. I'm Helga Davis from Q2 Music. And here's a reminder that you can tweet questions to Kronos using the hashtag Kronos. You have to spell everything out, K-R-O-N-O-S-A-T, the numbers four and zero. Who knows who Kronos was? The god of what? Amen. All right. Next, let's speak with violist Hank Dutt and violinist John Sherba. Welcome. Hi. Hi. John, a big part of Kronos's 40 years of experience and what may be the legacy of the quartet is the collaboration with composers and other musicians. Kronos has helped shape late 20th and early 21st century music. How do you decide who to work with? You know, it's really f terrific that we do so much touring mm -hmm. because, you know, when we go out on the road, we do maybe 100 concerts a year. And I have to say, we've been doing 100 concerts a year since, since I joined the group. I think when the group was founded, they did over 100 concerts, too. I joined the group in 1978, and I remember, you know, maybe the radius was smaller. You know, we didn't, we didn't get out of San Francisco as much. And then it gradually expanded, but we still did those 100 concerts. And when you do so many concerts, the audience comes, and in the audience are composers. And then, you know, we started to travel to Europe, we started to travel to Japan, we started to travel to Australia, China, and, you know, composers would bring us scores after the concerts. You know, they would hear what we were doing, you know, they noticed that we traveled with a sound person, lighting, and it would get their, I think, their minds working a little bit, and they wanted to, they wanted to write a piece. So they come back after the concert, hand us scores, and that's how we learn. That's a learning process is, you know, and we check out their scores that they give us. And David is really fantastic because he's always got his, everybody in the group has their ears open, but really David is amazing that way constantly. I always see him with headphones on in the airplane and and he, he, you know, he's always, you know, thinking when, when could this composer, when is the right time to approach this composer? When do you think they're going to write their greatest piece? And so, you know, it's, it's been great and we've gotten some really fantastic pieces that I'm so happy to play. In the almost four decades that you've been with Kronos, what are some of your proudest oh, accomplishments? Boy. I know it's that question. But. There's just so many. I mean, I have to say, any time we do a premiere, you know, for a premiere is really an exciting moment because you know you've you've been you get this piece of music, you've been working on it kind of in your room. First, you practice it alone, then you get it with the group, and then finally you go out on stage and you have to perform it, you know, in front of all all of the people and and kind of show what this piece is about. And that is always expi exciting, especially the first time, because you don't know. You know, you really don't know, are we going to get through it? You know, is it going to crumble? <laughs> you, know, you know, you've rehearsed it well, but you never know. And those moments, you know, I have to say, those moments are, have always been exciting, memorable, and they're still incredibly exciting, too. It's that thing, like, you can't rehearse the gig. Exactly. You can rehearse your music, but you can't yeah. rehearse the gig. Yeah. Hank, Beethoven quartets are categorized by early, middle, and late. How do you categorize, or do you categorize, the Kronos' uh, body of work? That's an interesting question, and it's very nice to be compared to uh, Beethoven. <laughs> 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 um, uh, when we joined, I think when uh, an ensemble gr first gets together, it, they have a, um, a learning curve. You know, I mean, it's you're, you're working, you know, very, very hard, and, and sometimes you, you work just on two bars for hours to get things correct and together and what, how everybody likes it. Um, but, you know, I think as we got together, uh, I have to leave Sunny out of here the, at the moment, but... Um, there was a period that we were working very hard, seven hours a day, and we're learning new repertoire all the time. And, and at that point, I would say that's the early period where we're really getting our chops together. And in those, that beginning, I, I must say, we, we, we took it upon ourselves to play all the contemporary classic works, all the Schoenberg, the Berg, the Webern, 
uh, Bartok and um, Shostakovich and those to get those under our belt, so to speak, and to because a lot of the the new music relates to those works, and by getting that done and and doing that, it was really a very good process because you you learn a sound that the quartet has you you get your own um, way of playing and I'd say that's the early period the, the middle period is one when you're just exploring more and more things and and feeling great as a quartet and I would say we're still in our middle period I would like to say <laughs> that we're not yet in our late period <laughs> I was just reading a novel the other or today and I came across this saying it was a really interesting saying it said you can't teach an old dog new tricks but if you keep learning new tricks, you never become an old dog. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Tell us a little bit about this next work that we're going to hear. It's called Taboo, and it's by Margarita Lacuna. Margarita Lacuna. I'm sorry. Is, no, that's fine. Uh, she's uh, Cuban, and she wrote about 300 songs. Wow. And one of the songs, I think it's... Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Oh, um, Babalu. Babalu, that Desi Arnaz made famous. And uh, this particular work is taboo, and the lyrics to it are were kind of racy at the time. Uh, it was dealing with an interracial um, um, relationships, and it's very, very sensuous, as you as you'll be able to see. But it has this uh, beautiful Latin Cuban beat with, uh, I think, conga. But there's also a relationship to the black African male. And so there is a little bit of that in there. And there's these, uh, this also this wonderful, um, it's not a maracas, but it's sort of a rattle that is in also the, uh, the percussion track, which is quite, it's quite engaging. You know, mm -hmm. there's just a, you just feel like you want to move in the islands or something. And then you see a, a gorgeous man or gorgeous woman on the horizon, you know, and it's really very, very sexy. Are you, is someone playing a different violin? Is there a stro violin or something here? On, on the recording, ah. uh, yeah, I, I, I can only travel with so many violins, uh, you know, th this tour there's four, so, uh, but the, the stro had to stay at home this time. Yeah. What, what is it? Why uh, is it? Or how is well, it we, we wanted to use it on the recording because there's this one section that it, uh, it was just perfect for. And so uh, I'll do my best live, but okay. you know, it's, it won't be a stro. A stro, is, in case you don't know, a stro is a violin that has a trumpet bell that comes off the bridge. And if you put your ear right next to it, it sounds like a trumpet. But if you're a distance away, it, it has this, this really cool kind of inner soft muffled sound that's that's very beautiful as an aside they used to record uh, all the in the very very early years of recording they recorded this with a microphone you know playing up to the 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 bell of it and just so that you could hear it better and and direct the sound that's right a, a lot of uh, concert violinists uh, in fact they didn't want to admit that they used those instruments but a lot of the very earliest violin recordings on the Edison cylinders were made on stro instruments. And Osvaldo Golihov arranged this, and what was his response to this work? Oh, he loved this work. I mean, it was, he's, you know, it's really hard to make an arrangement of an existing work. Um, we've had several people who've tried to do this, and, it, and what you have to do, you have to capture the essence of the work itself, yet to put it into our genre. Mm -hmm. And Osvaldo knows our strings, knows us, and, but knows how to write for strings so well. And um, he's a, a wonderful person, as yet, as yet a beautiful composer as well. And just this year, we're about to release um, uh, an edition of Boozy and Hawk's uh, music of six pieces that he arranged. And, and they're all edited by us, and this is one of the pieces. So this is going to be available for other quartets to play. So here it is, Taboo by Margarita. Tell me again the last name? Lacuona. Lacuona. And this is an arrangement by Osvaldo Galiov, performed by the Kronos Quartet live in the Jerome L. Green performance space.
That was Taboo, a piece by Cuban composer Margarita Lecuña, arranged by Osvaldo Galihov and played by the Kronos Quartet live in the Jerome L. Green performance space. This year marks the 40th anniversary of this string quartet. I can't believe it. We're at the final piece of the evening already. Uh, and this piece comes from Kronos's Under 30 project, which is designed to nurture the careers of young artists and to bridge Kronos with the next crop of co composers. Davis, tell us a little bit about the Under 30 project and how you choose composers. Well, the, the Under 30 project started um, when Kronos was about to turn 30. <laughs> and um, rather than having an under 40 uh, uh, call for scores this year, um, we decided to have the fifth under 30 um, call for scores. And we, we got about 400 submissions from, um, I believe it was 46 countries. And it was a, a marvelous array of creativity by young people from so many cultures and backgrounds. It was, it was absolutely astonishingly wonderful to be a part of. And tell us about the composer that you chose, yes. Mary Kuyumjian. Well, what happened is that Hank and John and I were listening and listening, and we kept coming back to Mary's music, Mary Kuyumjian. And for me, what, what I was hearing was I was hearing this composer who had loads of energy, a huge idea, and an identity. And it just felt like she could write something really big for us. And so we, we chose Mary Kuyumjin, and we called her, and she accepted the commission, and then she got to work and, and uh, made this astonishing work and I, I just got a I got a, a text message from my granddaughter who's 11 years old and she was an usher at our concerts when we premiered this work in San Francisco and she said are you gonna play Mary's piece on this tour because it was her favorite piece uh, and uh, so uh, it it uh, it's a very gripping work very personal work and what I hope every composer will do when they write for Kronos is um, make something they've always wanted to do and have, haven't had the chance or have been slightly afraid or just go for it cosmically. And I feel that's what Mary did. Why don't we meet her? Come on over here, Mary. <laughs> Welcome, Mary Kuyumjian, to the Green Space. Hi. Mary, tell me, were you, were you familiar with Kronos before? I know that you submitted the comp your composition and everything, but tell me a little bit about how you came to know about the group. Sure. Um, well, I had heard of Kronos Quartet. Um, I had listened to their recordings, studying music in school, and the first album that I really just fell in love with was their Nuevo album, which we just heard a little bit of just now. Um, and that album just really spoke to me, the ability to pull in uh, folk music from around the world and make it their own and bring it into a contemporary setting was something that I had been hoping to do with my own music, and it was a wonderful example. And also, the first big concert I had seen in New York was actually their performance of Different Trains for Steve Reich's 70th birthday party at Carnegie Hall. Um, and that piece is a huge influence on this piece that we'll hear, Bombs of Beirut, as well. It's use of text and a uh, message about wartime and such. And will you tell us a little bit about the piece? Sure. Um, Bombs of Beirut is, it's very much, it's a, a personal piece, as David was saying. It's inspired by loved ones who had lived through the Lebanese Civil War, um, family and friends that had been there during wartime. And you'll hear two components of the piece. You'll hear uh, the live performance aspect, which Kronos Quartet will be performing, and they play it so beautifully. And you'll also hear a pre-recorded backing track. And that track includes both interviews with family and friends, sharing what life was like day to day during wartime, and also um, a recording of 
actual bombings and attacks in a civilian neighborhood that were recorded on a little tape recorder placed out on the balcony in the late on a balcony in the late 70s in Beirut. So it's my hope that this piece just provides a small picture of what it's like to live during wartime, whether it's in the Middle East or anywhere really in the world. Let's hear it. This is Mary Kumyumjian, and her piece is Bombs Over Beirut. I always fantasize about Lebanon before there was a war. I always fantasize about Lebanon before the Civil War. I always fantasize about Lebanon before the Civil War. on instead of having the Civil War. I just imagine what an amazing place Lebanon would be right now. It's just a completely different world of what it was destined to be. I was born in 1950. No war during that time. I remember my childhood and a very peaceful life. I remember my childhood and a very peaceful life. Before the war, it was a very normal life, no matter which neighborhood or which part of Beirut you work, you can visit to any area of Beirut. There was no such thing that you will be scared to go to certain areas. What I remember of the war, I was in a monastery. I was sent to a monastery because apparently I was a very good boy to become a priest. But it wasn't the war, it was the prelude to the war. It was like three, four days they were fighting and whatnot, and the monastery was set up on the hills and we were watching the gunfire actually going back from one side to the other side. 
But that was the prelude. To collecting everybody and anybody who could hold a gun. Little kids with weapons bigger than taller than their own heights. By the time the war was going to start, I was shipped to Cyprus with my other two older brothers. So we were actually in Cyprus when the war erupted. One of the good things that my father did was to ship us to Cyprus, otherwise we would have probably been in some group fighting and probably dead by now. I was born in 1979. I was born on June 8, 1983. I left we left Lebanon, Lebanon, Lebanon in 1994. At the time I was born, there was no war. I remember. I remember. I saw everything. I remember my neighbors. I remember our house, every room in the house, the backyard, and the chickens. Growing up at war, I think. Five when you're six, you don't even know what's going on. Because I was younger, my parents did a fantastic job to kept us in a positive, happy environment. I have a lot of good memories. I didn't see any fear, or I didn't think I was in danger. It was kind of fun sometimes, but we didn't have to go to school. I would think that that's my life. You're a kid. Because when we planned our wedding, our date was in May, and we, couldn't we wait didn't expect that, that night fighting would have started then. Darkest night. I've never seen black. That black. We had to postpone the wedding because the church it was in the same area where the fighting started. All the lights were off and everything. The hospital was right next to our area, so even when I was having a baby, the bombs were everywhere. They had to move my bed from one room to another to keep me safe. Of course, there were other people too. But after I had the baby, I had to go home to feel safer, to be with my family. At that time, I had never seen so much weapons and tanks and M16s. As we moved deeper into the city going home, we realized what's been going on there. All the buildings destroyed. And then we started hearing stories about how the people, they continued their normal life, but any day, any small reason can start the fight. And that's what happened. 
down to the basement, like basically the we tall building used to go down. Bombs going on. Everybody with kids, older people, everybody has to go down. Everybody is in the basement, so the bomb came from the parking through that open window. And he's a tall guy, and he was standing and keeping everybody quiet and calm. Kids, they cry, and you know, it's a, it's a chaos. They know, you know, the kids are so scared, they cry. He was trying to calm everyone. And what happened is when the first came on that was I, he was the only one who was standing in his feet. So the bomb was chained and that spring and right to his whole legs. That's how he was
Take another bow. It was just beautiful. That was Bombs of Beirut, a New York commission by a new work commissioned by the Kronos Quartet for the Under 30 project. The Kronos Quartet members are David Harrington and John Sherba violins, Hank Duff viola. Gentlemen, come on out. David Harrington and John Sherba violins, Hank Duff viola and Sonny Yang cello. <laughs> Gentlemen and ladies, yes. And if you didn't get enough of Kronos this evening, there are still tickets available for their Carnegie Hall performance on Friday evening at 8 o'clock. We'd like to thank the staff of the Green Space and the folks at Kronos Performing Arts Association for all their help with this concert. I'm Helga Davis from Q2 Music. Thank you for joining us from the Jerome, Jerome, wow, I wait till the end of the evening and I can't get it out. From the Jerome L. Green Space. No, the performance, I still got it wrong. It's okay. 
it's very, it's very emotional, that piece. Anyway, thank you, and thank you very much, Mary. Thank you for coming out, everyone. Have a great evening.